Sometimes I figure out the weak spot in my videos based on the emails and comments they receive. And one popular video we did was all about Stephen Hawking's realization that black holes must evaporate over vast periods of time. We talked about the mechanism and mentioned how there are these virtual particles that pop in and out of existence. And normally these particles self-annihilate, but at the edge of a black hole's event horizon, one particle falls in while another is free to wander the cosmos. And since you can't create particles from nothing, the black hole needs to sacrifice a little bit of itself to buy this newly formed particle's freedom. But my short video wasn't enough to clarify exactly what virtual particles are. Clearly you all wanted more information. What are they? How are they detected? What does this mean for black holes? And in situations like this, when I know the actual physics police are watching, I like to call in a ringer. Once again, I'm going to go back and talk to my good friend and actual working astrophysicist, Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. He has written papers on subjects like the Bayesian analysis of cosmic dawn and MHD simulations of magnetic outflows. Whatever that is, he really knows his stuff. All right, Paul, first question. What are virtual particles? All right, no pressure. Thanks a lot, Fraser. Okay, okay. To get the concept of virtual particles, you actually have to take a step back and think about the field, especially the electromagnetic field. In our current view of how the universe works, all of space and time is filled up with this kind of background field. And this field can wibble and wobble around. And sometimes these wibbles and wobbles are like waves that propagate forward. And we call these waves photons or electromagnetic radiation. But sometimes it can just sit there and, you know, bloop, 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 just, you know, pop, fizzle in and out are up and down and kind of boil a little all on its own. In fact, all the time, space is kind of wibbling, wobbling around this field, even in a vacuum. A vacuum isn't the absence of everything. The vacuum is just where this field is in its lowest energy state. But even though it's in that lowest energy state, even though maybe on average there's nothing there, there's nothing stopping it from just bloop, bloop, you know, bubbling around. So actually the vacuum is kind of boiling with this, these fields, in particular the electromagnetic field, which is what we're talking about right now. And we know that photons, that light, can turn into particle-antiparticle pairs. It can turn into, say, an electron and a positron. It can just do this. It can happen to normal photons. And it can happen to these kind of temporary wibbly wobbly photons. So sometimes a photon or so, sometimes the electromagnetic field can propagate from one place to another and we call it a photon and that photon can split off into a positron and electron. And other times it can just wibble wobble kind of in place and then wibble wobble it pops into a, a positron and electron and then they crash into each other or whatever and they just simmer back down. So wibble wobble, fizz fizz is kind of what's going on in the vacuum all the time. And that's the name we give. These virtual particles are just the normal kind of background fuzz or background static to the vacuum. Okay, so how do we see evidence for virtual particles? Yeah, great question. We know that the vacuum has an energy associated with it. We know that these virtual particles are always fizzing in and out of existence for a few reasons. One is the transition of the electron in different states of the atom. If you can excite an atom and the electron pops up to a higher energy state, uh, there's kind of no reason for that electron to pop back down into a lower energy state. It's already there. It's, it's actually a, a stable state. There's no reason for it to leave unless there's little wibble wobbles in the electromagnetic field and it can jiggle around that electron and knock it out of that higher energy state and send it crashing down into a lower state. Another thing is called the Lamb shift, and this is when the wibbly wobbly electromagnetic field or the virtual particles interact again with electrons in, say, a hydrogen atom. It can gently nudge them around, and this a shift affects some states of the electron and not other states. 
And there's actually states that you would say have the exact same, say, energy properties. Uh, they're just kind of identical. But because the Lamb shift, because this wibbly wobbly electromagnetic field interacts with one of those states and not the other, it actually subtly changes the energy levels of those states, even though you'd expect them to be completely the same. And another piece of evidence is photon photon scattering. Usually two photons just fly by each other. They're electrically neutral, so they have no reason to interact. But sometimes the photons can wibble wobble into say electron positron pairs and that electron positron pair can interact with the other photons so sometimes they bounce off each other it's super rare because you have to wait for the wibble wobble to happen at just the right time but it can happen so how do they interact with black holes all right this, this is the heart of the matter. What do all these virtual particles or wibbly wobbly electromagnetic fields have to do with black holes and specifically Hawking radiation? But check this out. Hawking's original formulation of this idea that black holes can radiate and lose mass actually has nothing to do with virtual particles or it doesn't speak directly about virtual particle pairs. And in fact, no other formulations or more modern conceptions of this process talk directly about virtual particle pairs. Instead, they talk more about the field itself and specifically what's happening to the field before the black hole is there, what's happening to it as the black hole forms, and then what happens to the field after it's formed. And it kind of asks a question, what happens to these wibbly wobbly bits of the field, these like transient kind of boiling nature of the vacuum of the electromagnetic field? What happens to it as that black hole is forming? Well, what happens is some of the wibbly wobbly bits just get caught near the black hole, like near the event horizon, just as it's forming. And they spend a long time there and eventually they do escape. So it takes a while, but when they escape, because of the intense curvature there, the intense curvature of space time, they can get boosted or promoted. So instead of just being temporary wibbly wobblies in the field, they get boosted to become quote unquote real particles or real photons. So it's really like an interaction of the formation of the black hole itself with the wibbly wobbly background field that eventually escapes because it's not quite trapped by the black hole, eventually escapes and get turns into real particles. And you can calculate like what happens, what's say the expected number of particles near the event horizon of black hole. The answer is a negative number, which means the black hole is losing mass and spitting out particles. Now this popular conception of virtual particle pairs popping into existence and, and one getting caught inside the event horizon, that's not exactly tied to the mathematics of Hawking radiation, but it's not exactly wrong either. It's, remember, it, the wibbly wobblies in the electromagnetic field are related to these pairs of particles and antiparticles that are constantly popping in and out of existence. They kind of go hand in hand. So by talking about wibbly wobblies in the field, you're also kind of talking about the production of virtual particles. And it's not exactly the math, but you know, close enough. Okay, and finally, Paul, I need you to just randomly blow the minds of the viewers. Something about virtual particles that's just amazing. All right, so you wanna bend people's minds? All right, I was saving this for the last, something juicy just for you, Fraser. Check this out, it's one other big piece of evidence we have for the existence of these background fluctuations and the existence of virtual particles, and that's something called the Casimir effect or Casimir force. You take two neutral metal plates, and what happens is uh, this field that permeates all of space-time is inside the plates and it's outside the plates. Inside the plates, you can only have certain wavelengths of modes. Almost like the inside of a trumpet can only have certain modes that actually make sound. The, the ends of the wavelengths must connect to the plates because that's what metal plates do to electromagnetic fields. Outside the plates, you can have any wavelength you want. It doesn't matter. 
So it means outside the plates, you have an infinite number of possible wavelengths of modes. Every possible kind of fluctuation, wibble wobble in the electromagnetic field is there. But inside the plates, it's only certain wavelengths that can fit inside the plates. Now, outside there's an infinite number of modes. Inside there's still an infinite number of modes, just slightly fewer infinite number of modes. And you can take the infinity on the outside and subtract the infinity, infinity on the inside and actually get a finite number. And what you end up with is a pressure or a force that brings the plates together. And we've actually measured this. This is a real thing. And yes, I'm not kidding around. You can take infinity minus a different infinity and get a finite number. It's possible. One example is the euler mascheroni constant. I dare you to look it up. So there you go. Now I hope you understand what these virtual particles are, how they're detected, and how they contribute to the evaporation of a black hole. And if you haven't already, make sure you go to Paul's channel. You'll find dozens of videos answering equally mind-bending questions. In fact, send your questions and he might just make a video and answer them. So, does this make sense, or is it some other aspect of this that you'd like us to discuss? Go ahead, throw your toughest questions at me, and I'll just redirect them to Dr. Sutter. In our next episode, I have no idea what we're going to do for our next episode. Uh, you, I will surprise you. Make sure you stick around for the blooper. Now, you're watching this video, but there's a special group of wonderful people who make these videos actually happen. Our Patreon community. Thanks to the 530 patrons, we can make these videos, do podcasts, and write all the stories on Universe Today. Now, if you love space and astronomy and want to support us in what we're doing, please join our Patreon community. You get to see these videos ahead of time, hang out with me and the team, and see plenty of unreleased material. Oh, and we'll remove all the ads on Universe Today. We'd like to thank James Pauly, Raymond Bozinski, Jonathan Slocum, and the rest of the members who support us in making great space and astronomy content. Want to get in the action? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. It's really cold. All right. This is May. That's why I don't wear shorts. I know. All right. Shh. I'm not wearing shorts. <laughs> Finely tailored uh, shorts. All right. Sometimes I figure out the week. No, I'll, I'll, I'll give it more pause. Give it some time. Before. Yeah. All right. All right. All right.